Dear President Halonen, dear guests, 101 years ago, the foundation of Ob Academy University was established. During a time when chaos prevailed in our country after the First World War and the Russian Revolution. 100 years ago, Ob Academy University was founded. Among other things, the idea was that the university should guarantee young Finland Swedes education in order to be able to keep the Finnish society in two languages and in order to stabilize a disorderly town, Turku, and to offer educated experts to industry and business when rebuilding the country after the First World War and our civil war. 99 years ago, our work really started and the student core of Åbo Academy University could start its work. At the Finnish universities, we are requested to do research and to give education based on research. Until now, both the Department of Culture and Education in Helsinki and the universities prioritized research. Certainly, this happened at the expense of education, of teaching, which was reduced to a kind of secondary activity. However, it's our task not only to do research and to educate, but also to foster, to foster young people. We can read the university law, the second paragraph, I quote, and to educate students to serve their country and humanity at large, end of quote. Human beings are fostered all through their lives, but a stable value system is alpha and omega if we want education and fostering to be a success. We shall foster young people to serve two great entities. Our own country, we could ask, who is allowed to live in our country? And humanity, and we could ask, who is allowed to live? Who is not allowed to live? How should we let people live in our country? And now the crucial question comes, where do the universities fit in here? As assistants of the industry, as the support, supporters of the, poli of the politicians, as a representatives of a disengaged critic of the society, or as educators of revolutionary rabble-rousers. In order to start answering these kind of questions, and due to our 100th anniversary, we call for a discussion with experienced and reflecting people who have views and visions, but also a feeling of what is feasible and realistic. Today, Dan Lulax, a journalist at the local newspaper, Åbo Underrettelser, uh, and a reflecting critic of our society of today, will lead our discussion. I wish you cordially welcome on behalf of Åbo Academy University. Thank you, Ulrika, and also for my part, a very warm welcome this afternoon. Um, now, my job here today is, uh, besides maybe asking a few questions, just to try and stay out of the way, because uh, 
We have six panelists who are, I'm sure, eager to get on with their presentations and then take part of the following discussion. So let's get to it. Um, the first introduction will be made by Marianne Abdul Karim. She is a freelance writer, columnist, activist, and also co author of a recent book that's called Around 10 Myths About Feminism. Marianne, very welcome. Wow. Uh <laughs> Good afternoon. Okay. It says, wow, this is very loud. Um, it says, take a deep breath. <laughs> and I encourage you to take a deep breath with me. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, I am humbled to stand before you. We've had recently the Me Too campaign, and as a result, I'm the first speaker. No. <laughs> My last name is alphabetically, uh, happens to be with A and B. Um, okay, so I want to address a couple of things today. And, uh, well, Ulrika mentioned being realistic, and I think some of these might be realistic. Some of them are perhaps, uh, might be deemed from this today's perspective to be less realistic. I think we live in a society where we are in an... Um, in an escalating level, doing things on a more rapid pace. And by this I mean that the working life has become more hectic, and that means that our thinking has become more hectic, policy making has become more hectic. We seem to be living in this kind of constant, um, constant race with our thoughts, but also with the society around us. And when the policy makers, when our governments, those in positions of power are kind of signaling that now we have to hurry and we have to do this in a hasty way, then that kind of pushes the society also to kind of like think on our feet and be also as rapid in our uh, comebacks. And of course, it's unnecessary to say that this does not always lead to good results because in order to have lasting impact and in order to truly have policies that will cater to us also in the future, we need to be able to sit back, think, as Mauno Koivisto used to say, funderata, <laughs> a bit, to think about things instead of just rushing from one uh, phenomena to the other. So in a sense, I think one of today's uh, phenomena that I find very alarming as an activist, as a writer, as a parent, as a member of the society, is the panic mode in which we seem to be operating a lot of the times. And now I will go to the concerns that I have regarding today before I move on to the visions for the future and how I think it could be. Uh, I think we all share the concerns regarding climate change, uh, concerning gender equality and where we are with that today, social injustice or social justice, if you want to look at it from a more positive point of view. And I think one of the things that Europe has to deal with is the issue of the Roma. And I say this because for me, um, in my time as an activist, in my time as an active member of the society, one thing that keeps coming back is the situation and the conditions that the Roma community around Europe are pushed to live in. And I think it's safe to say, if I borrow James Baldwin's words, that the story of Europe is the story, or the story of the Roma in Europe is the story of Europe in many ways. Of course, it's not the only story. We have multiple stories, and this is something we can build on and something that we can use when we are moving towards the future. Uh, knowledge, standing here in Oba Academy's event, it's important to mention that knowledge is important. We need to seek knowledge, we need tools to analyze that knowledge and to deal with it, but knowledge alone is not enough. We have many people who are very knowledgeable, who have read a lot and who might have degrees from universities, but knowledge, when it's moved away from empathy and connection to social situations, it does not take us necessarily to a society that we would envision that we could all be free and fulfill our potentials. Uh, a dear friend of mine, who is also the editor-in-chief for Image, once wrote an article about relationships. And he was discussing how, in most relationships, people are having these um, debates about who is doing more in the house and who is doing less. And he said, what is heavier than any task that you have to do around the house is the feeling that the other person is doing less than you are. 
And if you've been following the climate change debate in the recent days, you, have no, you will have noticed that we're having kind of a similar debate on who should do more and who should do less. And it's not so much about how hard the tasks that we have to do would be, but rather the feeling that we have that someone else somewhere might be doing less than we are doing. And this does not feel like a just situation. And we need to find a way to move beyond that. And that's where we need knowledge connected to what is actually going on and connection to each other as human beings. And in Finnish, there's this word civistus. I don't know how you say it in English. I think being civil, civilization. <laughs> um, so civistus as a word, I mean, it goes beyond knowledge and beyond what you know to more like what you do and how you use that knowledge. And I think that's what we need. But more than that, we need to be able to build bridges. And as a anti-racist feminist, <laughs> uh, I often face this dilemma where people tend to think that, you know, everyone should stay kind of like in their lane, so to speak, that we have these different compartments in the society. And different people discuss different issues. But we have polarization arising in our societies and in our communities. And if we are not able to sit back, funderata, and find ways to build bridges to one another, to different communities, I think the future might not be as good as we would want it to be. Because the truth is, uh, for me, feminism is the tool. And it, it works for me. And I believe in that call. But at the same time, I live in a society with people who don't necessarily believe that that's the way to go about the change. So how do we communicate with one another? And how do we find a platform where we can exchange ideas and where we can accept the differences while still moving towards a society that is, fun uh, that is fundamentally equal? So, a few words about the future. <laughs> uh, I think the future... Uh, well, 100 years from today, because this is the task that I was given to kind of think what the world would look like, or at least Finland, 100 years from today. And the, cha the situations that we see in Finland, but also around Europe, is quite alarming on many different levels. But that doesn't mean that we should be in a state of panic and think that nothing can be done. We are all doomed to lose, because we can do many things. And if the actions that we take today, the histories that we create today, reflect on that future and where we can be, I believe that we can live in a more um, just, knowledgeable, and equal society. And I don't have this image in my head that 100 years from today, cars will be flying around, and you, know, you just think of a thought, and suddenly you will have someone catering to every need that you have. I think we most likely will be still doing some of the tasks ourselves. There will be a certain level of automated elements uh, added to the ones that already exist, inter um, artificial intelligence might be a reality, but all of these things are not things to be feared or to kind of to look to as something to replace what we have been doing so far. I think artificial intelligence will be as good as we are. It will be as clever, it will be as humane, and it will be as equal as we are. And this is something we have learned from the internet era, that sometimes you have these debates with high-tech people, uh, and when you realize the barriers that automated information seeking knowledge online creates, what are the groups that are marginalized from the access? They are the same groups that are marginalized in our lived realities, like in our physical realms. So if you have issues with elderly people not having access to online services, then you have issues with elderly people not having access in the society as it is. So the internet it's not some you know, mystical thing that happens on some other plane level where the barriers are different than the ones that we are experiencing. It's just it's how we think, how we see the society around us, and how we want to make accessibility available to different groups. Uh, I want to finish off with a thought from one of my favorite thinkers, uh, Audre Lorde, who passed away in the 80s. She wrote a book called Sister Outsider that contains essays and speeches. She, was a, she describes herself as a poet, but she was also an activist. So this is from her text called Poetry is Not a Luxury, and I'll only read the last piece because I find it very interesting. She says, <clears throat> For there are no new ideas. There are only new ways of making them felt of examining what our ideas really mean. 
on a Sunday morning at 7 a.m. after brunch, during wild lovemaking, war giving birth, while we suffer the, lo the old longings, battle the old warnings, and the fears of being silent, impotent, and alone, while, taste while, while tasting our new possibilities and strengths. And I think this is something that we can all ponder on, uh, the words of Miss Ward. And to conclude, I want to thank Oba Academy for having me here today. Thank you, Ulrika. And uh, I wish Oba Academy a prosperous next 100 years. I, my hope is that Oba Academy will remain and be a beacon of knowledge and civistus <laughs> in the society where new ideas, where old ideas can be rethought and new concepts can emerge from and show us kind of like create spaces and platforms where people can truly find bridges to each other's realities. That's it for me today. Thank you very much, and we'll continue over there. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Marianne. We're off to a great start. And just an announcement to you and the other panelists. I'm told that the apples are not for eating. There is for something that comes later, so just, just so you know. Uh, now, to our next speaker. He's actually born here in Åbo, but nowadays, I guess, just travels through the city mostly when he's on his way to his summer cottage. He is the governor of Sveriges Riksbank, that is the central bank of Sweden, and among other things, he chairs the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. And he is also honorary doctor, dare I say, at Hanken School of Economics in Helsingfors. Very welcome, Stefan Ingves. President, honored audience, uh, first let me congratulate Obo Academy on its 100 year anniversary. It's an honor to be present on this type of an occasion. It's also a privilege on my side from a more uh, personal perspective, and let me explain to you why. As was said, I was born here. My father studied economics at Obo Academy, and he was the treasurer of the student union. And my mother ran the restaurant. So I grew up listening to stories about what student life was like in what many of you would call the old days. It also so happens that I have lived a few years in Vasa, where you have your other location. And I have traveled Highway 8 between Obo and Vasa for 65 years. So it took a long time, but with this perspective, I'm home. Now, to today's topic, let me start way back. Say 250 years ago, this part of Europe was poor compared to many other parts of Europe. Not so today, not so today at all. Today, the Nordic countries belong to the most orderly, not corrupt, and wealthiest, with the most reasonable living conditions in the world. That, of course, raises the question, what made the difference? Without being a historian, I would like to argue that sound economic policies on average, because sometimes we make serious mistakes, openness to trade, the rule of law, an open mind, and acceptance of change. Education, and persistently more education, uh, made the difference. This is also why today's anniversary is so important. It's all about education. The creation and preservation and the use of lasting knowledge in a wise way. Now then, where do we go from here? During my professional life, I've had the privilege to work at the global level and to meet and work together with very talented and well-educated people from all over the world. Quite often, I have asked myself, sitting on a plane, going to or coming from afar, with increased openness and globalization, what does it take to stay ahead? 
How do we find and create talent? And how do we compete for talent? That's the issue. Nowadays, large numbers of people all over the world are well-educated everywhere. With enough income, you can pay to get your kids into the best uni universities and many up-and-coming countries and nations with ambitions also do the same. A brand name Ivy League US education has turned into an export industry. Now for us, with a completely different societal setup, with free education and more and more regional universities, how do we stay competitive at the global level? What should our ambitions be? Uh, given that we are where we are? Well, I don't have the answers, but the questions are highly relevant if we are to preserve our standard of living for another 100 years. In short, if your ambition is to punch above your weight, how do you make that happen? So let me give you some very personal and non-academic uh, perspectives on this, and I do this leading an institution uh, with a 350-year history and often with the opportunity to hire top talent within the field of economics. Presently, at the Riksbank, we have about 60, 65 PhDs in economics or finance uh, uh, working in our institution. First of all, it does not matter where you come from or what your ethnic background happens to be. What matters is your skills and your ability to use those skills. Now let's assume that you know the technicalities of your field and also have research skills. What else then do you need? And what else do you need to know in order to be helpful in forming policy? When do your words have an impact? First of all, you need critical thinking. You need to be able to question the conventional wisdom. You need to be able to challenge consensus. And you need to be able to think outside the box. Look around you and try to understand. Everything jotted down in the form of equations with Greek letters is not always a good representation of reality. In addition, and this is getting increasingly important, you need to have the ability to communicate in a clear and understandable manner, both in written form and orally. If no one can understand your thinking, it's hard to have an impact. In this day and age and going forward, a whole variety of communication skills are needed. Or, as Erik Axel Kahlfeldt, the poet, said more than a hundred years ago about Fridolin. Fridolin, this character, he had the skill to talk to farmers in farmers' ways and with learned men in Latin. I was lucky enough to be exposed to rhetoric at a very young age a skill which should get more emphasis in our part of the world. But it, is of course, but it is, of course, also a very, very good skill if you can master those rhetoric rhetorical skills in more than one language. So, know your field, be evidence-based, and learn how to talk. Outside an academic institution, it's also important to learn how to get the work done and how to get the work done on time. Learn how to cooperate with colleagues from different fields and learn how to appreciate an amalgamation of different competencies. To mix the knowledge of economics, political science, and governance often leads to very good outcomes in a practical policy setting but it's actually challenging to listen to those others. To put it in simple words, learn how to work. Strangely enough, when it comes to work, no such courses exist. It's all learning by doing. Now expressed in more general terms, 
we need both specialists with deep technical knowledge and generalists uh, with a very broad education. That combination uh, poses all sorts of managerial challenges, but I do think it's a winning concept for the future. Now, uh, moving outside uh, my own fairly narrowly defined world of economics, if we are to stay competitive and lay the foundation for another 100 years of success, we should allow for experiments, learn from others, be prepared to do and redo over and over again. The challenge for, for all of us is to foster curiosity and change. And while we do so, and now to borrow a term from monetary policy, we should do so over an extended period of time and in an orderly way. With these very brief reflections on my side, once again, thanks a lot for inviting me, inviting me home again, and thanks again for giving me the opportunity to say a few words on this uh, very important occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, we're off to a great start, so let's keep going. Uh, our next speaker is the leader of the Left Alliance and a member of the Finnish Parliament. She's also a city councillor right here in Obu and a former chair of her party's youth organization. And she has co-authored two books. Lee Anderson, very welcome. Thank you, uh, Mrs. President, dear guests. I'm also very honored, not just as a member of parliament and as a member of the uh, Committee on Educational Affairs in the Finnish parliament, to be here, but also as a person born in Åbo and as a not-so-former student of Åbo Academy. Um, but dear friends, imagine a world where you can create food out of nothing. Imagine a world where electricity, fuel, and protein can be created by resources anyone can access. Sun and air. What would that world be like? It would be a world where one of the biggest challenges to the well-being of humans and planet Earth would be solved. If protein could be created out of thin air and of sun, resources that are endless. There will be no food crisis, and food production could be done without requiring any natural resources or soil. And if resources such as electricity and oil could be created out of endless resources accessible for anyone, we would be talking about one of the most profound redistributions and democratizations of resources and power that the world has seen in ages. Does this sound like science fiction to you? Uh, it would so sound like science fiction to me too, unless I would have visited the University of the Technology of Lappeenranta two years ago. Uh, I thought it would be a visit um, among the same lines as many other visits that I've done as a member of parliament and as party leaders, discussing research and educational policies of the government and meeting the university, uh, meeting the university leadership. But instead, this time, I got to hear one of the most mind-blowing and inspirational presentations regarding climate change that I've heard in a long time. They presented two research projects that they were working on in cooperation with Technical Research Center of Finland. The aim of the first project was nothing less than developing a renewable fuel as a substitute for oil, made out of air and solar energy. And this was not only an ambitious aim, they actually presented the product itself. The other project that they presented aimed at nothing less 
than separating food production from the surface of the Earth. Basically, it means you can create food, protein, out of air and solar energy. And once again, we were actually shown the product itself, protein made out of air and the sun. Although the process and the technology that they used was still very far from being commercialized or used on a large scale uh, or transformed into large scale production, the technology itself was existing and it was working. And what they told me was that, well, you politicians uh, think that solving the greatest challenges of the Earth, you think that it's an issue of technology and research, but it's not. We already have the technology and the research that we need. The biggest problem is the limits to the ambition and the imaginations of the people in charge who have the political power. <laughs> and personally, I think that this is what the future of research and science should be about. Uh, why should we settle for an agenda less ambitious than solving the greatest problems facing both the planet and humankind? The whole world is facing enormous challenges due to climate change, due to the rapid decrease in biodiversity, the fast development of technology and artificial intelligence, and changes in both political and economic global power relations. At a time when prime ministers and presidents in way too many countries ironicize at academics and mistake opinions for facts. The first thing that needs to be say, uh, stated about the future of science is that there is no future without science. The future of the world and the future of, the hu of humankind is dependent on research, is dependent on innovations, helping us understand the complex issues that we face and hopefully also helping us solve them. For this type of research to be made, we need a model of governance for universities that ensures academic freedom and academic independence. This means more democracy inside the universities, more ownership of governance to the academic community, and less micromanagering from the politicians and the ministries of education. We also need university funding which is stable and enables both applied research and long-term research that doesn't necessarily produce the type of short-term results and applications that politicians and bureaucrats alike seem to be chasing. Hopefully, more stable and more long-term funding will also create more stable and long-term jobs because there can be no great research without the great minds of the researchers. But the future of the universities and the future of research and science will also be affected by the changes in the labor market and in labor itself. The fast development of automatization and artificial intelligence is often called the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, as Marianne Abdulkarim earlier said, nobody knows if we will see flying cars uh, in a few decades, and nobody can tell for sure how big this change will be and to what extent it will affect different jobs and the general amount of labor. In the wildest scenarios that I have heard, uh, a big part of our labor is expected to be replaced by algorithms and robots, which would change the whole social landscape and means of uh, income distribution in a large part of the world. In these scenarios, science, education and creativity becomes the most central part of production, since it's something that we can't automaticize. If machines take care of manual work, we can all concentrate on knowledge production, learning and empathy. This would mean much bigger funds and resources being directed to knowledge, research and education. But it's worth noting that even in the more modest future scenarios, the predictions is that knowledge requirement will, requirements will rise 
in all parts of the labor market and in all jobs. This means that everyone needs to know more. And everyone needs to learn, not just while formally educating themselves, but throughout their lives and throughout their careers. Lifelong learning has been a familiar educational concept since the 80s, but very few actual reforms has been made to create a society where continuous learning and continuous, continuous education uh, really is possible for everyone. At this moment, education is concentrated to formal degrees and to those already educated. In Finland, participation in adult education at the moment is at the lowest among male workers with no or little education. Finland is also the only country in Europe where the share of people graduating from universities hasn't risen between 2008 and 2016. I think the future of knowledge is one where education isn't as linked to formal degrees as it is at this moment. We will have opportunities to take separate courses at different educational levels, to train and learn certain specific skills according to our individual needs and according to our individual will. But the biggest challenge will remain the same as it is today. How can we build a system of education so equal that education will be a strong weapon to fight inequality instead of a structure upholding it. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Uh, a quote I picked up, Every, everyone needs to know more. Uh, that's a motto to, to follow, I think. Um, all right, let's move on. Uh, our next speaker uh, actually held the chair of uh, management and organization here at Obo Academy, and then he left, but let's not hold that against him. Uh, he is now the <laughs> professor of innovation, design, and management at the University of Southern Denmark, and uh, he is also the author of several books and uh, speaker at uh, many engagements as this one. Alfreen, Professor Alfreen, please welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, och alla ni andra. Uh, it is a great honor to be back here at my alma mater, at this nourishing mother that is Åbo Akademi University. And I come to you on this fine day also to carry the greetings of my new university, the University of Southern Denmark, who wishes you all the best for this centennial and the years to come. And I want to also to point out that the University of Southern Denmark, uh, we already have flying cars. Greetings from robotics and drones. Now, to be asked to speak of the coming 100 years of the university is, of course, an utterly impossible task. Were we to look back at where we were 100 years ago, a number of the things we today consider to be utterly normal, natural, even necessary in the university would have been utter impossibilities. I worked, for instance, at the business school of Åbo Akademi, at Åbo Hanken. Uh, the notion 100 years ago that you would actually have that in a proper university, and we're not counting the American ones, are, is, was an utter impossibility. You sim it simply wasn't done. The notion that we would have had subject areas such as gender studies, such as cultural studies, or disciplines such as nanotechnology, or the more abstruse reaches of biology, would of course have been just a pipe dream. Therefore, it is of course grossly unfair towards us on this stage to ask what will the next 100 years bring. The only thing that could be an exercise in would be in arrogance. Because the one thing we know that anything we predict on this stage is almost certainly not going to be the future of the university. The only thing we can know with any certainty is that the next 100 years of the university will surprise us in such fundamental ways that any claim laid forth here today will be basically a child's wish, a naive dream. 
But of course, I'm a professor and we are professionally arrogant, so I will try anyway. No, I won't. I will just remark on a few things about the necessity to think in a very complex way about potential futures for the university, and I want to emphasize the plural. To begin, we need to accept that the university needs to be extremely humble. Humility is not something that we often combine with professors and academia, but we know if we look at how the progress over the last 100 years has gone, we know that universities have time and time again been surprised by reality. I studied at a business school when we started hearing of this peculiar thing called the internet. These tubes of information that seemingly, as if by magic, did stuff. And I do remember how my professor said, well, that is a very lovely fad, but will never have any real relevance. I was not my supervisor, my supervisor being an excitable sort of, oh, that sounds fun, get me one. Um, so I signed him up for email, which he immediately regretted because, or actually, he didn't regret it, the rest of us did. And uh, an entire new era of trying to understand, for instance, business, for instance, society, for instance, communication was born. Somewhat later came notions such as social media, which we all immediately know was completely and utter, utterly unnecessary, ridiculous, and would have no impact on anything whatsoever, least of all politics. Because absolutely every political scientist said, well, frankly, it's going to be the newspapers who dictate the public discourse, and tr Donald Trump is an utter impossibility. So we know Universities have failed in humility time and time again, not because they didn't try, but because humility in the face of rapid change and humility in the change of the complex realities of today is incredibly difficult. And that means also that in order to think properly about the future of the university, we need to learn to think in sets of paradoxes, not to the one right way so time honored by many a researcher, but in paradoxes, in logical riddles, in Zen koans. It is F. Scott Fitzgerald who may have uh, inadvertently given us the finest example of this when he stated, it is the test of a first-rate intelligence to have the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the capacity to function. So when we gather here today to talk about the future of the university, it is not to present new truths one right ways, but rather to discuss the manifold of paradoxes, contradictions, hybrid truths, and possibly fake news that will define the coming age of knowledge. And will define it simply because the new disciplines, the disciplines we today might barely start to see, but which will in many ways surprise us in the decades to come, we will have to think about how the university as an institutional structure will relate to them. Close to my new office sits Sergei. Sergei is a professor of nano-optics. Sergei creates things that are not visible by the human eye, but somehow still plays around with light. I have no idea how anything Sergei does is humanly possible or makes any kind of sense whatsoever. A few way doors down from him sits a person who actually very much works with artificial intelligence and cognitive science. A few doors down from there, there is a room which says, do not enter, robot working can cause death. I have no idea what happens in there, but I'm hoping it's the Terminator, because, well, frankly, you do too want to share an office with the Terminator. What I'm saying is that we are going to start to see, in both technology and in the social sciences and in the humanistics, going to see an explosion of hitherto unforeseen fields of knowledge. And as an institution, the university needs to become much more quick in how it adapts to these things. Now, this is, of course, something people who look like me always say, but what they forget is that this does not mean an increase in the hyper-specialization of the university, but on the contrary, this points towards a kind of back-to-the-future logic of returning to the original logics of the university, which wasn't defined by disciplines, which 
wasn't defined by the very stiff hierarchies we have today in academia. It wasn't defined by the need to split knowledge into thinner and thinner shards. But on the contrary, creating the university as a space in which learned men and women, originally men but increasingly women, could actually freely explore all the reaches of human knowledge without being too bound by specialization and discipline, without being too conditioned to publish in increasingly unread journals, without being too coaxed by the slow institutional forms that we still pretend somehow defines knowledge. So we need maybe to go back to the groves of academe, the free space of thinking, in which each new discovery actually was hailed as something grand to think of, play with, in which imagination, experimentation, even frivolous idling away of time was actually honored, in which dons and donettes were allowed to walk the groves of academe, mostly undisturbed by claims of producing quick results and easily measurable such. Instead, they, our ancestors, those who came before us, just loved truth and knowledge and beauty, explored it, not caring whether they ended up in paradox or in challenging places, in which you could take a break simply to think very hard about some new thing for a couple of years. I do not know the future of the university. I can dream, I can wish. I can hope for, but I do not know, because nobody on this day is can know. Nobody in this room can know, not even Mikko. I had to do one. I had to do one. But what we can be certain of is that if the first 100 years of Orbo Academy was a grand adventure, a strange adventure with uh, odd original people and uh, strange building projects and weird new subject areas popping up, that is probably very small compared to the endless mysteries we'll still explore, the bizarre subject areas today, not even a glint in the mailman's eye that we will see, and that people like Sergei, the nano-optician, like the people in gender studies, like those in studies as of yet to emerge and to have proper names, will think of. It's going to be a wild ride, and the only thing we need to remember when embarking upon it is the need for us and for the university of humility and being able to think the paradox. Thank you. Thank you, Alf Rehn, a wild ride indeed. Um, uh, our next speaker, and now I'm getting a bit nervous, she was the 11th president of Finland and the first woman to hold that office, and before that she was, of course, among many things, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Social Affairs and Health, and Minister of Justice for the Social Democratic Party. It's a great honor to introduce President Tarja Halonen. I look at them, they look wonderful. Just a full hall of the people who want to listen to us. You look also wonderful, okay. So, um, uh, I'm glad to be here today at the Obu Academy. It's a little bit strange to speak here English, but anyway, I was already practicing my Swedish, but... Okay, but anyway, very warm congratulations for Obu Academy. I say it in the beginning that I don't forget it. The second point of what I want to say is my warmest thanks for the Obu Academy because your work for the human rights. 
And uh, this is especially coming now. I don't know why you have invited me, perhaps because of my past. I have been a president and so and so on, what you said. But I'm today the chair of the board of Helsinki University. So very warm greetings also from Helsinki. So um, interaction between science and society is very important. I think that you have all said it in, in one way or another. And um, I'm very keen on that because the role of universities will be also, and is today already, very, very crucial in sustainable development. Uh, both in research and implementing ideas into action, and, but also providing new solutions and technologies. So, um, you have spoken mainly, and I think that, that that has been the agenda also, that what the university and, and research will be after 100 years or so. But um, it's also important, not only that where we are now, where we will be in the future, but also the bridges. And uh, so I will say that the next bridge for the future is also that uh, we have next spring a lot of elections in Finland, and it will be very important for ensuring basic and higher education and their funding. The past years have been difficult and demanding for universities, not only in Helsinki, but also in Turku. And it is important to have a common goals for universities and to get universities work together for their goals. And we should make people who are running for the parliament in April or for the European parliament more and more committed to support education. I'm very happy that they have heard my old slogan, education, education, education. It's much better than Russia, Russia, Russia. But, um, but it is uh, also important to implement it. And that's why whatever is the party you would like to vote, just make the candidates very, very committed that we are not like an old scientist that we are trying to make gold from the from nothing, but we need also some resources. I learned to speak about money when I always spoke for the human rights. And then my good old colleague in, in that time, the Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd, said to me that, Tarja, that's very fine what you are doing, but have you noticed that <coughs> uh, at least the 50% of the male uh, audience will take the mobile telephone and start doing something else? But if you speak a little bit also of money, you might awake them. I have noticed that fantastic, but remember, this is just a side effect. We need, we need economics, we need money for, to be a means for the better society, but it's not the purpose of the better society. So, I think that I don't need to preach that uh, the free research and the autonomy of the universities are very important. Um, but... Um, a high level of education as well as comprehensive knowledge and learning, it, it really increases well-being. Uh, this also provides the basis for the active citizenship, what I consider that it is very, very important in modern societies all over the world, but also in Europe, also in USA. And education helps also address global challenges and also why not? It also contributes our own motherland, Finland. So, um, top level basic research is needed to produce true innovations and sustainable solutions. But sometimes it's good to study and think about the, such kind of the issues, which perhaps are not directly changed to the innovations. So, even being independent, Universities in the future should live in close relation with society in order to be uh, able to make their own decisions about uh, the uh, essence of the activities. So the, I agree what you said. Universities and scientists and teachers, they should be curious and able to take risks in research. I always take an example of children. Uh, I think that most of you either are the mothers or fathers or have been or will be. And when you look at the, just the very newly born baby, how intensively the baby will learn to turn or to, uh, to, to get to learn to walk or to speak. And so with this intensity, we should keep the curiosity 
in our life. I don't know what we do, the parents and grandparents and education system, but somehow people become much more passive. We should, in all possible ways also, to wake up it again, because always a majority of the people, the population in Finland and in our other countries, we have an old-fashioned education. And I always say for the younger generation, it will happen with you much, much faster than what it happened with us. So you have to be prepared for the lifelong learning, but you don't need to sit at the schools or the universities all your life. But learning, that's important. And to be curious, to make uh, stupid questions, like my smallest grandchild, not a very, very smart little lady, uh, four years old, she looks at me and says that, why, why, mummy? Sometimes she says mummy because it doesn't make the difference, but <laughs> why, why? And then I try to, to learn to answer to that. So in relation to society and its uh, many actors, there is a need for substantial and versatile cooperation between the society and universities. But what makes the true dialogue? So you have already mentioned this also. Our understanding of sustainable development, for instance, and the current state of the planet will play a more important role in the future. And then we have this difficulty that we, everybody needs a lot of uh, knowledge in general know-how and, and, uh, and information and science. But at the same time, in order to be able to solve these issues, we need also expertise. And how to put these people together? And uh, so, I think that uh, we have some ideas, at least I have now some ideas, because I think that we are always looking at this relation between the society and the universities, but you could also look at yourself. I know that we have, we have done this horizontal, horizontal new uh, working points, and, and we try to improve this kind of the connection. But I think we should do much, much more in this, this case. So, uh, the other thing, what I, I think that where, where I hope that uh, universities could help us is, of course, that this education, uh, I think that the, um, the education system in Finland has, uh, has earned a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, good uh, uh, profile for Finland, and it's a real profile. I mean that we have not invented it. It is something what we can say that, that, that it is, and it has been, and we are, uh, we are very, very eager to improve the system. And now I think that uh, now the early pre so-called preschool education have become more and more important, and this is perhaps also one response for the question why nowadays um, in the society even we have to everybody, so-called, opportunity to get an, uh, also the higher education, why it doesn't happen so, so, so fast it used to be, because now there are more and more parents who have already much longer education, also formal education, and they of course can help their children also at least to become convinced that you can do that, that you know that I have done it, why not you cannot do it too? And normally pa uh, children have quite good self-confidence compared to their parents. They, they think that they are much smarter. And so in that way, those kind of the mothers and fathers who say that, uh, okay, I understand that you don't like mathematics, I, I didn't either, they are, they are very, very dangerous. And also such kind of the mothers and fathers who say that, you know, boys are boys, they will have a good future anyway. Yeah, that was true in undemocratic society. But I said always to our children, in our new modern type of the family with different kind of children, I said to the boys also that, yeah, in old days that, was, that worked. But nowadays you have to study as hard as your sister. And I, 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 I'm gone. Con we, I'm, I'm convinced that you can do that, but you have to want it. So that's it. But then coming back to the 
money a little bit. So I encourage you for the next elections how to do it. But what I will say also that the private money is very much welcomed. It's not because I'm here in Turku. Um, I say it also in other places. But I always say that, uh, that money is very difficult to catch. And um, this is concerning both the public and private money. It takes time, it needs skills, and it needs cooperation. And um, we will also need an international funds. And it would be good for Finland to strengthen the profile of the quality-driven basic research and research-based innovations in the EU budget and operations. Money is, as I said, it's difficult to catch, but it is still something we can do. And um, I know from my own experience that one special difficulty is combined public resources and, and funding from the private side, not only be, being the chair of the, Helsinki, uh, the board of the Helsinki University, but also being the chair of the board of the Finnish National Art Galleries. So, then the last point what I would like to say is that um, I think that they are the same people inside or outside of University Lee. So we, it's not so romantic. They are exactly the same kind in politics and, and in universities, at universities. Uh, some are smart, some are less. Some could be much smarter than they, they dare to be. And that's why I think that uh, we should encourage everyone, everywhere, try to use the full potential. And uh, that's why I also say that uh, the cooperation interaction between Finnish universities is highly needed. We have already good, good efforts on that. A good example for this kind of interaction is UNIFI, a cooperation and organization for Finnish universities. It promotes higher education and research by addressing far-reaching uh, university-related issues. It also aims to influence the Finnish higher education and research policy and to promote common interest of the universities. But let's intensify it, because uh, this is a small country, and quite easily we can create the networks in order to get the common goals and common profile, knowing that the, we have the differences in different parts of the Finland, but still we have just one parliament. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, what to do with this money, I leave for the discussions, but uh, I have already mentioned this uh, special issue of the male persons of this country, but um, this is also covering the other subject, what I have in my mind, which is the number of the school dropouts and decreasing number of the graduates from the general upper secondary school. So really, I don't think that we... Our education system, it's not specially, how could I say, gentle for the girls. But the model what we have been teaching already for a few generations for the girls is much more fitting for the modern urban society than that Seven Brothers model what we are trying to tell it's good for the boys. And uh, in that way, I always take also an example from Tehran, because Tehran University had more female than male students before one of the leaders uh, thought that it's good to have a 50-50. And this happens in all over the world. I mean that um, this is the time to stop the discrimination of the boys. So, um, just um, last, um, I'm ready for the panel. I don't feel my, myself very much academic, but uh, I know that I always speak about the sustainable development, and that's I'm ready to do also here. But everything else, what might be the honorable moderator, come with you here. And uh, just the last point is that we need to remember that years spent at the university are also years spent learning to live in our society and becoming its skillful members, in skillful, active members. So I know that in many of our universities, the length of the studies is important, 
but I would only underline the issue that it's not the only issue. Let's hope that we let young people to grow good citizens and fellow human beings uh, when the system is democ democratic and good enough, so also that will serve everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Tarja Halonen. Can I get... Please, please. Yes, we can share. Right, and so for our last speaker, uh, who is from Sweden, is a long-time journalist and the author of several books. He has won many awards, among them Stora Journalist Preset, and for his widely acclaimed book, A Brief Stop, uh, on the road from Auschwitz, the August Prize. Joran Rosenberg, very welcome. First of all, <clears throat> thank you so much for inviting me. It was uh, a great surprise to me, and I hope it uh, is a great surprise to you as well. But I will try to, to justify my, my presence here. Yesterday I was taken on a nightly tour of Obo, Old Obo, the o Obo of the Obo Academy by a friend. He might be here, Bengt Christensen Ugla, who is a professor here. And it was a beautiful sight, especially at night when all the buildings were illuminated and the lights shone from inside the libraries and you can see the students sitting there at their laptops. And I thought, um, that is how the university of the future should also look like. Because there is something about the aesthetics of a university, the buildings, the environments, the peace actually, which is per perhaps larger at night than at day. That uh, so it was very impressive and it inspired me actually and it, uh, it made me even more nervous because I realized this is a real university, Obo Academy, with some very nice buildings and a nice environment. I also had the privilege or non-privilege to be the last, so I have been sitting there imagining what all the others were to say and trying to imagine what I would say that they haven't said already. So I will start saying something about to imagine. What is it to imagine? Of course, the ability to see something perhaps that is not for everybody to see. The fruits of our imagination are primarily only visible to us. And if we are able to share them with others, they might be visible to many, even if nothing still is visible to the eye. This doesn't mean that the imagined is unreal. If many people act upon what they imagine, well, if even one person act, act upon what he or she imagines, then the consequences might be very material and very hard, and they can be li life and death and war and peace, and you can hit your head in the wall, and it can make the difference between civilization and barbarism, imagination. Not to mention, of course, art, architecture, music, literature, and yes, science. And I will say something more about that soon. In fact, a great part of the world in which we live and by which we are formed is the product of our imagination. We are as much formed by the word of our imagination than, uh, well, the word of cultural creation, if you so wish, uh, as by the word of nature, the word of biology, chemistry, physics, and all that. The state of nature is not a human state of being, to say it provocatively. That doesn't mean that the word of nature has been superseded by the word of culture, by no means. But as culture has been able to bend and amend nature, even to the extent that we can imagine ourselves being its masters, our ultimate dependence on the natural environment that is making human life possible has been increasingly easy to imagine away. 
And even as we imagine that we, through the means of biotechnology and artificial intelligence, can free ourselves from the constraints of nature, it should by now be quite clear that nature is the ultimate arbiter of life on Earth, and thus of human culture. What we must be able to imagine then, more than ever, are the potentially fatal consequences to the environmental conditions of our culturally constructed world. That world of human thought and action that our capacity for imagination and creation has made possible. This brings me to the issue at hand. What science, what knowledge, and what wisdom must we be able to imagine in the university of the future? Well, already in the university of today, I would say, since we don't seem to have much time in certain respects. So first, science, knowledge, wisdom, what are these words? Is there necessarily any connection? Can science, no matter how rigorous, even foster human ignorance and folly? One is reminded of T.S. Eliot's famous saying, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? I, th I think some may tend to equal science with knowledge, or rather tend to see scientific knowledge as a knowledge of a higher degree, more true and more useful, not the least and that our universities are the custodians of this kind of higher knowledge. I fully share the appreciation of science and scientific knowledge, but I do not share the idea that science necessarily is a knowledge of a higher degree. Science is a particular form of knowledge with strict requirements regarding communicability, verifiability, replicability, and falsifiability. Sorry, all these words, but they are there. But what can be known through scientific inquiry is necessarily limited to those spheres of experience, of human experience, in which its specific methods can be applied. Science will give rise to questions of a particular kind and foster answers of a particular kind. All research is not scientific research, and most knowledge is not scientific. The knowledge of the trained hand, for instance, the knowledge of the trained eye, the knowledge of personal experience, that kind of knowledge which cannot so easily be compared and measured and communicated and be programmed into an algorithm. In fact, I fear that with the development of artificial intelligence and the capacity to put things into algorithm will again make that kind of knowledge a higher kind of knowledge, while knowledge that is not possible to make an algorithm out of will be deemed lesser knowledge, which is, which is a great mistake, not to mention the fact that if the artificial intelligence robots take over, they will know so little about it is what it means to be a human being. Well, they might not need human beings, but as long as we are here, we would like to have them, human beings. Science is an important and very powerful tool for knowing particular things, and uh, its findings, as we know and as we have heard, have revolutionized so many things and will still revolutionize many things, and is really a necessary way a necessary tool. But it's only uh, one of many tools and languages employed by mankind in its incessant need to imagine and understand and the world in which we live and understand ourselves in this world. Science can only explore that which is accessible to scientific inquiry. So the first thing I wish to say about the university of the future, that is that I wish we should be able to imagine in that university, a science that again sees itself as an act of human imagination, primarily. That again sees itself as part of what we call the humanities. To that broader quest for exploring and understanding the human condition and the place of humans in this world. 
which was why universities came into being in the first place. This means that we must also be able to imagine a sphere of knowledge and of human experience that cannot be understood through the methods of science or natural science, perhaps to be more precise. This is in fact the kind of knowledge that make up for the larger part of what we know, not to mention what we don't know. And what we don't know is infi infinitely more than what we know and will ever be so. The question of human meaning, ha meaning has of course no scientific answer. Neither has the question of human value or moral responsibility. Some may argue that questions of this kind are not the business of the university since they don't have any definite answers. And that knowledge that is not measurable and computable and not evidence-based, as it's said now, is a knowledge of a lesser value. But it is clear to me that the university of the future must again allow these questions to be asked and to be explored, since these are the questions by which we try to make sense of the world and make sense of our actions in the world and act in a way that will make the world of nature inhabitable by the world of culture. The field of human knowledge and human action, what we can know and what we can do, is essentially a field of human imagination. What we imagine and how we imagine is decisive of what we know and who we are and how we act and what we may become. Let me end by saying something about the perhaps larger, largest challenge, I believe, to our imagination today. That is to be able to imagine what the new means and tools of communication, and that has been mentioned already, of course, can do to our ability to know and value the difference between truthfulness and deceit, between the honest exploration of the world, of the, of, of the quest for knowledge, and the conscious abuse and distortion of knowledge where truthfulness succumbs to delusion and lies, radical ideologies easily fill the space. Our universities are historically based on the competitive advantage of truthfulness against lie and deceit in social affairs, in politics, and of course, in the university. In fact, this is the basis of democracy. We haven't even been able to imagine a situation where the lie might, be, might have a competitive advantage to truth, that it will be more powerful and will gain more to lie than to tell the truth. At a conference some 25 years ago, that was long before Facebook and iPhone and, and, uh, and the industry of fake news and what have you, I noted that this rapid growth of information that we then were able to perceive penetrated everything, everywhere, with no one really knowing from where it was coming. Our image, uh, and, and, and once it was disseminated out there, it could never be recalled, it was out there. Lies were lying there forever as anything else. Our image of reality, the experience of our senses, in increasingly, it was an increasingly uh, way being, being uh, transformed into the experience of representations and of representations of representations. Direct sensory experience lost its value even more with some sensory capacities perhaps of ours now withering away because we don't use them. Computer technology permits people to meet other people's construction or programming conceptions of the world, not the sensory world as such. It has been observed how, this I wrote 25 years ago, I'm sorry, uh, be behind the veil of digi the digital screen, social restrictions rapidly break down and sexual taboos lose their prohibitive power. To attempt, even on a purely theoretical basis, to calculate the consequences of all the actions open to us and sometimes even pressed upon us by all this is futile, end quote. Well, 25 years later, we are beginning to see the consequences of a wholly new era of communication, an era which will, well, we can't even describe it, but it, it, it will definitely end the way we have uh, 
supposed a, an era of public uh, communication where the, with, the, with the printed word, with the text, with all these things. Today, anyone can say anything to anyone else in the world. It can be a lie, it can be a truth, and it is disseminated immediately, and it stays there. And it can be used, and it can be abused. And we don't know how to deal with this situation. It has created Trump land in America. It will create all kinds of lands in Europe, and we haven't seen the end of this. So, what I would say at the end is, as a task for the university of the future, how can we again make truthfulness or the commitment to truthfulness compete with the increasing power of lies and propaganda? The university of the future must be able to make humanity crave for truth and honesty in its quest for meaning and understanding. The university of the future must be the custodian of truthfulness. Such a university, I believe, will also make us wiser. Thank you. All right, and while Joran is getting a new headset, let me just say, boy, where do we start from here? There's a lot to discuss. Um, there was talk about imagination, of course, and also curiosity, and uh, um, also not micromanaging uh, universities. So let's start like this. Um, if we don't know what the future brings, we have to commit to some guiding principle for the universities. Now, who should put forth this principle? Who should say to the universities, this is what you should aim for, or should anybody? Um, who wants to chip in first? I mean, how independent should the universities be to actually fulfill their role in society? The point of the university uh, was, well, in order to obviously to uh, teach Latin, which we are sadly have forgotten, uh, but uh, to be a free space, a sacrilegious space even, a space in which you could uh, talk ill of kings and uh, uh, talk down to the priesthood. Uh, and that is actually what created science, proper science, proper research, utter freedom. No principle of guidance, no notion that there was somebody who could tell you what would be the sensible way forward. And I think that that is, of course, we romanticize the future of the, the university because we we kind of, I think, academics hark back to that <laughs> glorious time, but uh, the truth is we, the future of the university might still might be become one of uh, basically ordered research. Do this, achieve these tasks, tick these boxes. We obviously on a stage like this will romanticize the future, but uh, the dark future, the taboo future of the university is just as likely as these beautiful dreams we may have presented. President Hallow. Yeah, I think so that um, there is a certain right for the universities to keep the autonomy like it has been because uh, even the science and, uh, and universities, as I already said to, you, to my friend Lee, they are the similar persons like what we have in the politics or other parts of the society, but uh, it's also experience from the harmful combinations of stronger connection between the society and the university, so that uh, we should say that if, if the planet Earth is not the center of the university, so, so we universal system, so should be the freedom to say that. And, and so um, this is one thing, but then you mentioned the imagination. So I come always back to my, uh, <laughs> my favorite idea what I have learned during the recent years is that when we have two sides of the brains and uh, we know people are using one side or another side more or less so that we need also the bridges between the, and the, the, these two parts left and right and I normally I'm provocating men and say that they have less these bridges what the women have <laughs> but they are very happy with those amount of the bridges they have. But, um, but in the matter of fact, um, we have not spoken too much about uh, emotions and feelings here today. Some of you mentioned it already. 
But um, when we have tried to uh, get better system analysis in sustainable development, we notice that even people have a uh, lot of uh, information they have well educated, but there is a certain difference between uh, learning and understanding. And one of these things is that uh, in, in Finnish, I think it's a very good word, oivalus, that you have to feel it, that it's, it's, it's okay, and then you learn it much, much, uh, much easier. And um, we should study also that what makes uh, very obvious things to understand, for instance, in sustainable development, what makes it so difficult to implement, why, why the people don't really to, to implement it, what's, what's, the, what's the reason for that? Of course, everybody can say that, that um, it can also cause a very dangerous society, but I have always said that, don't worry, the populists have already used it, that it's a time to use it in a positive way, that uh, what, is, what are those blocks that people don't use, their imagination, what are those blocks that, that they don't want to learn more, um, what m should make them more curious. But um, uh, there's only one limitation, what I say to, to the university. Uh, my, my limitation is that the human rights, the democratic principles and all that, uh, they should be also part of the university. But otherwise, just yalla yalla. <laughs> <laughs> Lee Anderson and then Stefan Ingves. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in a Finnish context, I think uh, that the discussion about what um, autonomy means for, for universities, the discussion, t this discussion isn't finished. So there is no shared uh, concept between decision makers and universities about what the actual concept of academic autonomy in Finland means. Uh, and this could... Uh, this gives birth to a very a situation with a lot of contradictions in terms of how governance is done, uh, in terms of how educational policy is done, where you're saying that, yes, the universities have uh, autonomy in terms of governance, but then you have a lot of politicians with a lot of strong will in terms of what the educational system should create in terms of policy, and society who are trying to micromanage uh, the universities through the financing model. And I think, I think this is a discussion that needs to be continued also, both on the side of academia and on the side of politics, that what does this mean, and wi which, in which direction do we want to go. And uh, my, my own opinion, if we compare to what Alfred said about the original uh, form of university where learned men and women meet each other and talk and they are not in a hurry anywhere and they have the possibility to take a break for a few weeks to think about something. I would say that that's more the model we should go in, in the direction of at the moment where the issues and that are being researched and the, the, the problems that the world face are more and more complex. So if we w really want to have science and research that, uh, and researchers that have the possibilities to focus on these issues, then we can't micromanage them and say that you should do more and more publications and you should just concentrate in your own field of work, because then we will get no research where the learned women and men meet each other just to think. It's like a wise, very wise friend of mine says, she says that boredom uh, is a condition for all creativity. Uh, so if you don't have the time to be bored in the university, how can you ever come up with any new, <laughs> oh, we any just new get thoughts bored. or innovations? <laughs> we, we just get bored very quickly these days. <laughs> so I, um, I think that the, now we're at a point where they are making reforms in the finance models every two years. Um, maybe uh, exaggerating a little bit, but still it's reforms after reforms after reforms. And then you are making cuts in the finance at the same time. And all of this is taking, it's contradiction, in contradiction with the, the thought of autonomy as I see it, of academic freedom and of uh, the freedom of academics to also be bored. <laughs> so that should be a guiding principle for the university. It's allowed to be bored. Yes. Boredom allowed. All right. Stefan Ingves. Well, um, I do think that we should really pressure the right to think. That's, of course, hard to do, and that should be combined with what uh, Rosenberg talked about, commitment to truth. And that's, uh, 
very difficult to deal with in this in this golden age because there are many threes using zero, and you can also uh, present or groups in many different ways, and that makes it, of course, harder. So one needs to spend a little bit time, little bit of time on uh, explaining to others actually what you are what you are doing. But having said having said that, we should treasure the right to think. No society is so wealthy and so rich so that you can just let people wander around aimlessly being bored. Eventually there's got to be some kind of an output. Otherwise it just won't, it just won't work because somebody's got to come up with the money uh, to pay for all of this. And that's why we of course have this conversation and that's why we have this, this debate. So the hard part of it is really to find a good combination of treasuring the right to think while at the same time making sure that there is an output that also can be applied in one way or the other. Because otherwise you end up with sort of completely independent satellites and no one can really understand what these people are doing. That's why you always will have to make compromises, reasonable compromises when it comes to find the proper balance between the right to think and producing outputs that can be used by others. Uh, Marianne, we'll get to you, but Lee has a comment on that, I think. Yeah, of course, it's very easy to just comment on the world being bored, uh, being bored. Um, but of course, I think the, the main issue is exactly this, that um, what, to what extent do we allow the universities themselves to concentrate, con to concentrate on the work that's done and to know, to trust the academic community in terms of what is a good output? Uh, I remember when the Educational Committee in Finland visited Switzerland and we met some local politicians uh, and they were asked, like, what are the main, main policy goals for the university system here? And they, they said that we have no other goals than for the universities to be the best. So we just give them the money and they can do whatever they want as long as they are the best in the world. And that, that was their, like, uh, their thinking in terms of how to combine academic freedom with some kind of financing model. And I think this is war, what I'm aiming at if you compare it to the Finnish system where you have, where you're trying to micromanage how many people with how many degrees and how often and publications and so on, uh, where it seems that the main way of uh, measuring quality is uh, in terms of amounts, amounts like quantitative, um, quantitative results. President so, yeah, I will just uh, add that uh, there is a control and there is a control. The money talks. Money talks both in Turku, in here, and the money talks also in Helsinki. And, and it, it talks in, in different forums. That if you discuss with uh, the Minister of Education, and they say that um, we see that we are lacking this or that kind of the people, could your university perhaps a little bit... Uh, Intensify the education or, 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 or research in this sector, we would be very, very happy to, to help this flagship or the other, other terms you have created in, in, in legislation for that. And it works. And I have nothing against that in that sense that universities have two, three different kinds of the duties. One is, of course, the free uh, research. One is, one is education, education of civil servants. Uh, I take one thing which has been very, very important now. We needed Swedish-speaking lawyers. And, and so the third point is that we need also, then you are serving the society and the world, the humankind. So I mean that two sectors are more or less what you can think, but education or of our civil servants, it's, it's something we really need. And why I mentioned the Swedish-speaking uh, lawyers, it's that the government is complaining that they, they have no, not enough people to translate the legislation. Uh, of course, governments can have a different kind of the excuses, but, but I know also that when I have been working with the Northern Islands, for instance, and, and sometimes also the Swedish Swedish education, I know that that's true, that uh, I could almost say who, 
who of these uh, civil servants in the Ministry of Justice can, can speak Swedish so fluently that they can work with this, uh, this part. And I mean that this is that, this is a practical life, and that's why I say always that wherever, what, whatever I would like to see, the money talks. Marianne. Yeah, thank you. Um, to kind of go back to the original question regarding universities and autonomy, I think, of course, I mean, I don't think uh, any, like there can be a really rational argument made to say that universities should not have an autonomous uh, position in the society. With that said, um, I like what President Hallinan said in regard to human rights being part of the universities. And if you look at Finland and the fact that it's not that long time ago when we were using scientific methods to determine whether the indigenous people in the Sabi region are equal human beings as those living in the South. So science has been also used in a very problematic way from a human rights perspective. So there has to be some kind of, and I think in the university today, definitely we have ethical committees and so on to make sure that such overboards will not happen again. But then to that respect, I think university um, in Finland is still quite white. And I think this is a problem. Uh, and it's a problem because in knowledge production, we need everyone in the society to be part of it. Because lived realities and experiences are a key factor as well when you are producing knowledge. And when we talk about this natural, nor like uh, neutral knowledge production, I don't think any of us is neutral. We all have our set of ideas and opinions and experiences that have an impact on how we view things or how do we limit our target research or group or whatever. So these are elements that we really need to take into account and how do we create that? How do we make the university of the future here in Finland, for example, to be less homogenous so that we would have people from different groups? Like I would love to see universities having uh, Roma professors running programs on Roma studies and Roma history in Finland. We don't have that yet, so yeah. Kito. Thanks. Uh, we're having some difficulty with the sound here, but I hope that everybody still hears what we're talking about. All right, so we're gonna pass the mic along to everybody who's, who's talking. Is that including me as well, or? All oh, right, I'm the only <laughs> one, oh, that's <coughs> difficult. Joran Rosenberg, we can pass, pass the mic along uh, here if possible. I, ha I have I, one You have here. a mic, all right. Yes, um, I have one here. So Miriam was talking about, uh, and you also, I think, about this concept of, of knowledge versus wisdom. And I was thinking about the university, what role it has in society, what sort of force uh, uh, you can expect of it. And I mean, you have written extensively about uh, European history, for example, and know that, I mean, university are no, no guarantee for atrocities not to happen. You talked also about truth being sort of a big part of this competition, that you can actually compete with truth. In this day and age, and considering what you have written about, how sure are you about that, that truth is actually something valuable 100 years uh, from now, or even 10 years? And what role does the university play in putting forth that idea? I don't know if you noticed, but I didn't use the word truth. I used the word truthfulness. All right. Because truth is really an elusive thing, and, 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 but truthfulness is an ambition. This is a, let's put it even a, a moral ambition. I will, as much as I can, look for the truth according to my ability. This is the, and, and, and uh, this has been the tacit, uh, uh, sort of basis for all uh, inquiry, human inquiry, has been the aspiration to truthfulness. We know that there are lies and people lie and there are all kinds of, but we always imagine that this was, a, 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 this was, a, had a competitive advantage, I use that word, to lie. Eventually, truth would win out. That's, that's a saying we have. We are now living in a time where we're not so sure anymore that truth will win out. And let me then try to explain what I try to say with, with my plea for a university that, that seeks truthfulness and not necessarily seeks a specific, uh, specific result, a specific value for those investing in such and such research. This is what we see is taking over more and more. I think there should be, and I also made a plea that 
universities and even the sciences should go back to what universities were at once, universities of the humanities, of the human quest for, for understanding and meaning. And if the universities understood themselves not as producers of various results of kinds, of this product, of that product, of, of the solution to this problem or that problem, but as custodians of this really basic human uh, endeavor, I think we will also have a new understanding of the humanities as we today understand them in the university that are not understood properly today. They try to make themselves look like nat natural sciences. They want to produce the same kind of results, uh, comparable, measurable, uh, useful, etc., etc. Sometimes it's absolutely ridiculous because so many aspects of humanities lie in the quest itself. Of course, an informed quest of history, of social scientists, of literature, of, of whatever have you, philosophy, of course. But they have to understand that they must justify their existence with other arguments than the arguments that are now justifying, uh, let us call the, the, the productive sciences. Because this is another side of the human uh, knowledge that we need. And if we understood that, to, to get back to your question, Dan, I think it would be a sign of wisdom to do that. I think we are really foolish now with playing down the importance of the humanities in our universities, as many universities are doing today. Um, somebody wants to chip in on that, or I have another question as well, and that has to do with something I spoke to Stefan Ingves about a few weeks ago when we did an interview. And you basically said that um, every generation has to need the, make their own mistakes. We were talking about financial crisis uh, and how they sort of repeat uh, over the course of a few years. And, and even though you might think that um, people learn, that we learn from those crises, we seem to make the same mistakes, or not maybe the same mistake, but mistakes because we think we learned our lesson. So then the question is, um, uh, why can't the universities, universities pre prevent this? Is this some sort of human condition that we cannot get uh, away from? Or is there a flaw somewhere, either in, for example, the financial market or in the universities themselves? Marianne, do you talked about more diversity. Is that the problem here, that we are sort of, even if we think ourselves broad-minded, we are still in our own small circles, not thinking too much about what future uh, uh, generations before us have made uh, for mistakes. Anybody wants to comment on, on that? Sure. Uh, well, I think diversity is definitely the answer. And the situation we're living in now, uh, specifically if you look at Europe, it's very different than what we have experienced in the past. And by this, I mean that traditionally, Europe has been a continent from which people have migrated from. Now, for the first time in its history, more people are migrating to Europe than out of it. Uh, Europe has been seen historically as a white continent, as a continent with Judeo-Christian traditions. Uh, albeit there is a history with Islam as well, but that's not in the history books that we read. And that is also changing rapidly. And now we also have these human rights movements. We have different uh, marginalized groups who have been pushed to the margins, stepping to the center more and more. So we have uh, disabled uh, activist movements, we have anti-racist movements, we have feminist movements, we have trans movements. So the movements are coming to light because of the legislation that we have today, because now it's more possible to be who you are than it was before. And I think this is pushing us to conversations that we're not used to having. Before I think like, even if I look at my childhood, I mean, it was more traditional to see on TV uh, white middle-aged men debating on issues regarding different minorities, and it was considered quite normal. That of course these men are taught, they must be experts. And now it's, I mean, we, we still get that sometimes, but it's getting rarer. 
that if we are discussing different groups, then it's more natural these days to have representatives of these groups uh, discussing the issues and addressing and so on. And as diversity kind of comes more to the light, I mean, people have always existed, different groups have always existed. The Sami have been here forever, the Roma have been here more than 500 years. But the changing situation means that the groups that have been in the shadows are moving to the light, and now we can see more clearly. And some people are in a bit of a state of alarm because suddenly they are not the most significant pe people in the space, and some people are feeling threatened because what they consider to be their privilege or like something that they're accustomed to is no longer as easily available to them. And I think uh, we need to discuss these fears and we need to be kind of build bridges how to address these concerns because if you just say that, you know, uh, we don't want to discuss with these groups, then how do we go on? How do we move forward as a society? Because one thing I don't think is possible in the future is having a society where you only have like-minded people <laughs> who will be like, you know, uh, I will only live with my group. No, you have to live with everybody who lives in the society. And these people can be of very different backgrounds, different histories, different knowledges, but that doesn't mean that they don't have a say in what happens in the society in which they live in. And this brings us to my last point on this. I think we need to learn more how to deal with conflict. I think even in the universities, we should have more awareness of conflicts. For example, you and I are different people. We have different uh, ideas, perhaps. I don't know. But the fact that we are different shouldn't be something that we avoid discussing. That we shouldn't be afraid that, oh my god, something might come up and then he will realize that I don't think like him and then it's over. Like, no. Little conflicts happen every day. But we just, I think we need to be more accustomed and we need to move past the idea that the West have had for a very long time that we just need to assimilate people because this has not worked in the past. It will not work in the future. So we cannot push people towards assimilation, but we can manage conflicts and we can teach and learn ourselves how to better deal with conflicts. And I think that also includes accepting that there are multiple knowledges at each given time and there are multiple truths. And my truth is uh, equal to your truth, but it doesn't cancel each other out. And this is something we also need to accept and understand. Thank you. So let me let me let me give it a, give it a try and just to, with reference to what you just were talking about. When when I was working at the IMF, I had the privilege of having people people from 50 different countries working for me, and that was of course a wonderful experience. Sometimes things went totally wrong because we had different backgrounds and didn't fully understand what we were talking about about on, on both sides. But at least on my side, it was absolutely uh, fantastic, and I, I enjoyed that. But to your question, the issue is the following, that we human beings find it very difficult to deal with the future. And let me maybe be, let me be overly explicit. If I drink too much today, I get a hangover to tomorrow. And if I do that a couple of times, I sort of realize what will happen. But that knowledge is very, difficult for us as human beings and in our societies to use if I do something today which will cause us trouble 30 years from now or 50 years from now. Because the way our brains operate using my technical language, we tend to use a very high discount rate for the future. So we tend to ignore the future. And if somebody else shows up and tells you that if you do this in that particular way, bad things will happen 10 years from now that we have great difficulties to deal with when it comes to how we organize ourselves as societies. Your questions came in the context of talking about financial crisis. And their history is crystal clear. Each generation has always said, this time is different and we recreate the same old problem so that the financial sector goes bust. And we never, we never learn. But that way of reflecting on things is not that different from, let's say, talking about global warming and environmental issues. Because the, the difficulty is exactly the same. That like we're supposed to do things that hurt a bit today in order to avoid bad things happening in the future. And it's just so easy, the way we organize ourselves as societies to say, well, that may be so, but not on my watch. So just let's ignore that for now. And this is, this is really, really hard to deal with. Thank you. 
So maybe a bit more of that humility that uh, Alfred spoke about. I think we take this order now. Uh, President Halloden and then Lee Anderson and then Alfred. Yeah, very shortly, when we spoke about this financial crisis, so I, I want to take a very pragmatic example. Um, I was co-chairing the ILO's uh, World Commission concerning the social dimension of globalization. We worked about uh, three years, and, and we get an uh, uh, consensus a report. Uh, the only country, I think, that which was very strongly criticized in Europe was Finland. I remember when we launched the report, so they said that this is a typical nonsense of Halonen. But, um, but uh, of course, I felt it personally very strongly. I tried to say that the idea that uh, uncontrolled international financial capital is a risk for the future, of the, even for the market economy, and so I don't remember, luckily, the name of the professor from uh, who said that this is just a nonsense, that the market economy needs freedom. But then a few years later when it all happened, so uh, of course they said, why didn't you say it beforehand? I said, of course we couldn't know that where it happens and when, but th there's a general risk concerning this kind of uh, um, money without any kind of the, the, the control. And, and so there are a lot of similar systems so that when we know that if you do it this way, it can happen that way. And, and so especially what comes for the, um, uh, for, for the concerning environments and, and, uh, and all this kind of the science. So that we should take very seriously. I mean, it, it's not a question that how you feel it. It's important that how you feel, the personal experience, but this is not the fact which is against that you know that it will happen in such a way. With human beings, I'm not so sure, but I'm still convinced with, uh, with the human rights, but, but anyway. Um, so that's it. I mean that uh, they are the different kind of the sciences, a different kind of the beliefs. The other one. Yeah, I guess the problem, I don't think it's the fault of uh, the universities that we make the same mistakes again and again. Um, but I, I was thinking in, in, in the same lines that the problem is that history never repeats itself in exactly the same way as it used to be, which makes it very easy for people to, or for us, for all of us, for all of us to blind ourselves and think that this time it's different. Or in this specific case it's different. We can't really uh, make connections to things we have experienced in the past an argument uh, that's very common in terms of politics, for example, when we try to analyze what certain decisions now will mean in terms of minority rights, in terms of the policy we are doing at the moment, in terms of asylum seekers, for example, where many people refuse to discuss uh, historical parallels. They are refusing to listen to those kinds of arguments, saying that this situation is different. It's uncomparable to what has been in the past. Uh, the, same, uh, the same logic applies also to issues of climate change and the, uh, the decrease in biodiversity, that it's hard, uh, hard to think of actions now in the context of what will happen tomorrow or in 10 years. Uh, what the so solutions should be, I agree with Marian that I think one or two things that are connected to diversity uh, we need more diversity within the universities, of course, and that's something that should be uh, like a guiding educational policy principle like throughout the educational path because it's also, of course, something that starts at a very young age, like how you treat students, how we direct students to diff in different paths in the Finnish educational system, uh, how different experiences um, are being, um, how we respond to different, the different experiences uh, of different students within the educational system. But the other issue is also that I, I think that the universities should also work more on opening up to the society at large. And this is something you notice, I guess all the academics are tired of hearing this because you feel that you have enough to do already. Um, but I think you notice it in parliament, even in the Committee on Educational Affairs, Without counting, I would guess that we have more experts that belong to different trade unions or different uh, um, educational organizations than we have actual academics, like experts talking about their own research and what they are uh, researching in, in the universities at the moment. 
So there's a lot of talk about how we need research-based decision makings, but we don't really have enough places for people to meet. Not, not, not enough formal places for the debates and discussions and for meetings, and not enough informal places either. Um, and I think in a society that, that fights that is trying to fight for truthfulness in an era where lies are more com com competitive. Um, I think also we should be focused more on how to popularize science and research, not just, not just in terms of um, natural sciences, but also in terms of humanities. Like, how can we communicate to people what we are thinking about within the universities? I think it's an ask. I think the sole full-time academic on the panel, uh, I should point out a certain organizational issue. Now, personally, I'm of course the kind of academic who's been told that I could visit the university once in a while rather than run around everywhere else. But uh, I'm speaking here for the, the, a lot of the academics in the room. So we've now been told we should educate the young, create technological miracles, solve injustice and inequality, uh, preferably prep politicians, save the world and be warriors of truth after which we'll have a light lunch. Uh, I, think, I think that um, what's often been forgotten is there is a, a actually quite severe organizational problem in universities. Our structures are bar very rigid, sometimes by law, uh, sometimes by institutional pressure. The power hierarchies are still very kind of stuck in an almost medieval way in which the professor is always right particularly the professor of innovation. Uh, we have <laughs> created uh, rigidities in what researchers need to do to be able to gain a permanent position, which today is something akin to finding a unicorn. Uh, so, um, so yes, I too wish all these wonderful things for my fellow academics, and I have been the lucky one. I've been, able, I've been allowed to, to do whatever I please in my academic career, but I am the single lucky one. Most academics are working under tremendous time pressure. Uh, most adjuncts are fully aware at this point that they will never gain a full-time employment and probably never a proper pension. Uh, quite a few of the junior scholars are sitting, hoping that, uh, well, actually debating, do I wish the professor to die or might there come someone even more horrible if he does or she does? So, I mean, they, we can't ignore the fact that if there is to be a future of the university in which achieves all these great things, which I think everyone here would wish them to do, we need to talk about what kind of organizational and institutional changes need to be introduced, what kind of power regimes, or Foucauldianly speaking, what kind of epistem we wish for the university of the future, and uh, to realize that it is uh, not just that academics have chosen to be boring and inward looking and uh, irrelevant and what else have been, we have at times, not here obviously, been accused of. Uh, we are, have many other things, but rather mundane things to be solved. And personally, I would just wish for an economy system that can be sorted without having three assistants. <laughs> That's not too much to hope for, I think, Lee Anderson. Well, well, that's why I started out with my boring, boring comment about the financial system, because honestly, I feel that the biggest problem is the contradiction between saying that you are autonomous, and this is the governance model for autonomy, and then having a finance system that creates uh, this uh, environment for the younger academics and for a lot of academics in Finland, where you have, like, you have uh, cuts in funding, but then you also have reforms in funding, which means that you have to apply for research grants at a more a quicker pace, there's more bureaucracy, there is less long-term jobs for academics at the universities, and all of this creates an atmosphere of precariousness. And maybe it was wrong for me to say that you have the right to be bored, but, but what I was aiming at was saying that in this environment of precariousness and of constant change, uh, in how in the financing and uh, research grants and, and it creates an atmosphere that makes it impossible for people to focus on saving the world and the human and kind, which I, I don't think is a bad aim for the academic world. <laughs> Just very short, the private money is not easier. 
So the, the basic uh, funding of the research and education at university is very, very important. Private money has also their ideas. Thank you. All right. And well, I, I didn't expect any applause. <laughs> <laughs> And I know we're, yes. No, just, I mean, just let me add to this conversation because it's, we have talked a lot about freedom to think and all those things and how painful it is to deal with the money and a budget and wouldn't it be wonderful if just the money showed up and there are no obligations going with it. But there is another debate that I find very, very important and we should, that we should not forget. You know, when you're young, you'd like to really do re research and nothing else. And sometimes you find teaching is kind of painful. But teaching is serious, because if we don't understand, if we, if, we, if we are unable on the academic side to teach, if we are unable to tell stories about the future in such a way that others understand what you're talking about, then you really have a problem. So don't forget that, don't de-emphasize teaching. And I know we're running a bit over schedule, but I hope it's, we have time for one round of questions just quickly, because I think also what Stefan Ingves said about teaching and how, of course, the university presents itself. We, we talked a bit about it, but I know, Marianne, you, have, you wrote a column about making education sexy uh, for, for people, so, so to, to notice it. And so let's take a short round, just talk about the relevance of the university. Is it sort of self-relevant, or how much do the universities need to fight for their place in society, and, and what is the best argument? Joran, if you start us off. I will first uh, wholly subscribe to Stefan Ingves' uh, talk about teaching. Teaching has been, uh, for a while, sort of downplayed. Research was everything. The best position you could have was a full research position. No teaching, no students, no... I think that's absolutely wrong. I think this, the relationship between teacher and student is the basis of the university and must remain so. And, and, and the best and the brightest should go and teach. This is my uh, opinion. When it comes to um, the role of the universities, really this is so, so difficult because we have so many interests out there wishing to claim the university for all kinds of purposes and they are not always the same. There has been, of course, in Sweden at least, an enormous trust in the universities or the, uh, the um, university colleges to, uh, as a solution to all, all our problems. I mean, if we can get everybody into the university, basically, that has been a Swedish idea, uh, and have a university or higher education, we will be better off as a society. I'm not so sure at all, because I think there are so many ve venues for young people uh, to educate themselves, to gain knowledge, to practice, than to go to university and be bored, seriously bored, fatally bored. So, so and then, then, then there are these who want the universities to, 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 to bring forth products, uh, inventions that can gain the economy, create growth, uh, all these things, and there are large companies that want to use the universities to do research for them, basically, and they put in some money to, 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 to make that happen. It is another goal of the university. So, so the universities today lack an idea, a common idea, and I don't know if we can, can get back to that, but I wish we could. Because university is, or at least the part of what, what I've been trying to say, of what we need in our quest for understanding this world. And universities have been historically a very important part of that. Maybe they are not anymore. But then we are lacking something because we don't understand the world. And as you said, I mean, we are going in all kinds of direction, maybe because we are finding ourselves, I'm now my, this is my identity, this is your identity, and this is how I am, and this is how you are. But we are human beings at the bottom, and that this is what, at the, this moment of history, is absolutely crucial that we reinvent ourselves as human beings. I'm not saying the difference will go away, they won't. But we must be able to, to see things a bit larger than that. This is, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, President Holland, you want to add to that? Agree with Joran Rosenberg? Yeah, quite much, but I would say that uh, the uh, act concerning the universities in Finland is pretty good in such a way that, that they, they are both the research, education, and serving the 
society, the human guide. And, and I think that um, how then to choose and why I, I have said already that uh, universities could have this autonomy they have today is that to make the right choices. This is a um, right and duty of every human being and this is also for you at universities. You have to make a correct choices, the balances, how to do it. And, and uh, I hope only that you get, could get more financial resources so that you don't need to cut the lessons and lectures because of that. But uh, the time schedule, this is in your hands and, and you have to make the correct choices. Yeah, sorry to say, that's the life. I think I, I, think I managed with this actually. Um, um, I, I don't mind using your microphone. Why? Don't take Why? this personally. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, I think that in order for universities to capture re their relevance, we really need to think about, uh, as I kind of implied, the organizational structure. Currently, it's very, very much so that, well, research reigns supreme. We say nice things about education. We do that all the time. We say nice things about outreach. But if you're to go up in the hierarchy, you need to prove yourself research-wise. That's it. And there are colleagues, fine, fine researchers, who are awful teachers, absolutely horrific teachers. And that's okay. That is completely okay. <laughs> Not everyone is great at everything. But what we need in the university is a promotional and incentive system that allows for various kinds of academics of the future, that allows you to become a professor simply by being an incredibly good university administrator. Who are, who's brilliant at structuring educational programs, who's brilliant at creating a great working climate for others. Whereas there should be research professors, people who don't teach simply because they're so awful at it. And there should be educational professors who actually can gain that level by being very good at university teaching. If we don't have that flexibility, in some sense, it doesn't need to be tied to titles, but that notion of having a more multiplicitous, a more diverse, if you will, uh, incentive structure, then there is the risk that the relevance of the university will suffer over time and over super specialization. That's simply the fact. Organizations matter, and our structures of organization matter. Anderson? Um, I think maybe at this point, um it's not the responsibility of the universities themselves to prove their um, relevance, but maybe more time for the rest of the society to understand um, the relevance of the universities and to also make decisions that show that their re relevance really is understood and is valued um, in society at large. Personally, I have to say, I read uh, a research that was made in the universities in Finland after it was kind of an evaluation of how the new University Act um, has played out within the, the academic communities and how people were feeling about decision making and, and the working climate in the universities. And it was absolutely a horrendous reading, to be honest, because the results were really bad. Like the picture that were, was painted um, in terms of how people working in academia in Finland felt the climate within the universities and how they felt that their input and work was valued. Um, it was horrible and it was really like a wake-up call for me personally. It should be a wake-up call for anyone reading those papers to think about how can we uh, as decision makers or in parliament and a society at large make sure that the structures are as good as possible uh, for the academics and the researchers and the educators to be able to focus on their work and to do it properly, because that's also the best way uh, to get um, qualitative research and good results out of the system. But clearly we are not doing uh, good at the moment and I don't feel that we should add this responsibility to all the other responsibilities that the academic already ha have to, to prove their um, relevance. <laughs> Thank you. And if um, you miss... I think that one way or the other, any organization has both the responsibility and, and, and need to tell a story about itself a story that others can understand, because then that's how you justify your relevance. If no one can understand what you're doing, even if you do good things, 
eventually you're going to end up with a serious problem. And so you just have to spend a bit of time on thinking about what is my story and how can I make others understand my story because then maybe they look at me in a more favorable light compared to not understanding anything at all. Mirian, you get the last word at this. Uh, yeah, well, maybe to conclude, I definitely agree with myself in the column that I wrote that we should definitely make <laughs> knowledge sexy again. Uh, thank you to my co-panelists. It's been very enlightening and I have a lot to take home in my mind regarding this panel and lots of things to think about. So universities can also be platforms that allow these kind of discussions to happen and these, kind of ex these types of exchanges. So I'm humbled and grateful. Thank you. All right, and I think that with that, our time is up. Thanks to Marianne Abdul Karim, Lee Anderson, President Tarja Halonen, uh, Stefan Ingves, Alf Rehn, and Joran Rosenberg for a very enlightening discussion. And thank you also to the audience who had the time to listen to us. Ha, <laughs>
and elaboration as well.